Today we're talking with George Galster, the Clarence B. Hilberry Professor of Urban Affairs at Wayne State University. There has been a long tradition in American social science of thinking about the life chances of people being determined by nature versus nurture. And there's an ideology often associated with right-wing political groups that says it's your genetic basis that will determine your life course. And another group says, no, it's much more your family and how your family will raise you. But in the last 25 years, there's been a new voice that's been rising that suggests it's not just family. It's the context in which the family has to operate. It's the public school system. It's the neighbors and the children with which your child will play. And it's a lot of other contextual characteristics that will help shape the life chances of children. So it's more than nature, and it's more than family. It's context. And part of that context is the neighborhood, but the neighborhood really stands for a variety of institutional features, some of which are supplied by the public sector, some of them supplied by the nonprofit sector, and some supplied just by informal social networks that will determine whether there is in fact equal opportunity in America. If you allow for the possibility that the neighborhood context in which children are being raised in are not equal, then you have to ask the question, well, how much does that matter? Okay, things are unequal in the environments in which children are raised, but so what? Does that explain a little bit of why children turn out differently as adults, or does it explain a whole bunch? And that debate has been ongoing for at least a quarter of a century in the United States. Poor neighborhoods in the United States are almost always located in metropolitan areas that are depressed in a variety of ways. Center city locations, locations that have quite challenged, if not bankrupt, public school systems, locations that often are bereft of local employment opportunities, locations that often have very active underground economies, if not, if not above ground, illegal economies. And what all of these aspects of environment do in concert is create an incentive system for children of minority status and low economic status that essentially encourage them to do the wrong thing, to make the wrong choices. It appears from the research that I have done that the opportunity structure changes dramatically when the percentage of poor, officially poor individuals in a neighborhood exceeds approximately 20%. When that threshold is exceeded, all sorts of things appear to change and not change for the better. The research suggests that we should try to achieve a society where concentrations of poverty are kept well below 10% in any neighborhood. If poverty concentrations are kept low, the neighbor's property values are not harmed. Similarly, the worries about crime increasing or other kinds of social problems happening when the poor move in seem to be exaggerated if we can create a situation where low-income people constitute a small percentage of any given neighborhood. So I think that the benchmarks are very clear in American society. We have, as a long-run goal, to create neighborhoods that have some poor people, but not too many poor people. And that is a huge political and practical challenge, but I think enlightened social policy can can have the tools to create that option long term. The primary vehicle that we have today for creating mixed income neighborhoods are number one at the federal level to think about reorganizing our housing choice voucher program. This is a rental supplement program for low income people to 
access apartments of middle quality in the private rental market. Now, right now, there are no requirements in this program for low-income people to choose these apartments in low-poverty neighborhoods. Similarly, there's no requirement in this program for landlords in low-poverty neighborhoods to participate and accept vouchers. I would recommend that both of these features of the program be changed. There are other incentives that I think can be provided at the state level. We have several states that have created what are called inclusionary zoning policies. These are requirements on new developments to set aside a certain share of the buildings in the development for below market price, subsidized, if you will, occupancy. And some of these dwellings can be for sale, others can be for rent. But the point is that you would end up with a greater income mix within this development than would otherwise be the case if you just let the private market do its own thing. So I think these two kinds of strategies are proven to be successful if we could adopt them at a broad scale level. The problem is in the United States we've been unwilling to invest the political capital to make these difficult choices.